abortion in the United States, at least as it has taken place in the courts, in the media, and among most ethicists, has for the most part focused on the moral status of the fetus, that is, whether or not the fetus is a human person. Typically, the pro-life advocate, as well as the abortion rights advocate, has argued in the following way. Uh, one, if the fetus is a person, then abortion in almost every case is unjustified homicide. Two, the fetus is or is not a person, therefore abortion is or is not, in almost every case, unjustified homicide. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman, who uh, recently uh, turned in his resignation to President Clinton, uh, wrote uh, the majority opinion in Roe v. Wade, and he reasons in exactly the same way. In fact, he writes, quote, if the suggestion of personhood is established, the appellant's case, of course, collapses for the fetus's right to life is then guaranteed specifically by the 14th Amendment. The scholarly and popular literature produced by evangelical opponents of abortion seem to take this posture as well. Uh, in the 1970s, the groundbreaking works uh, by Harold O.J. Brown and Francis Schaeffer and C. Everett Koo presuppose that if the fetus is a human person, then abortion in almost every case is unjustified homicide. In the 1980s, uh, theologians who have written on this topic uh, have thought likewise. Uh, However, in 1985, evangelical philosopher Robert Wenberg, in his book Life in the Balance, defended a moderate pro-choice position employing an argument first employed in 1971 by MIT philosopher Judith Jarvis Thompson, in which she argues that even if the fetus is a human person, abortion, at least in the early months of pregnancy, is still morally justified. But nearly all the books published since Wenberg's, which cover the issue of abortion, um, including uh, books by R.C. Sproul, Paul Fowler, Randy Alcorn, and others, uh, do not address this argument, uh, with the exception, uh, I must say, of the recent work by John and Paul Feinberg, uh, who teach here. They do deal with that argument, as well as an article by uh, Keith uh, Pavlicek, uh, who's uh, involved, I think, with the Crossroads uh, 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 think tank or institute. Uh, he's uh, addressed it as well in Public Affairs Quarterly. But for the most part, that, uh, that argument has not been addressed, uh, despite the fact that right now, within the legal uh, literature, uh, there seems to be a resurgence of this argument, a suggestion by many people that it should, ought to be used by the Supreme Court in order to uphold Roe v. Wade. Uh, let me go over the argument uh, in detail. In 1986, uh, this article, uh, in which uh, Thompson's uh, argument appears was the most widely reprinted essay in all of contemporary philosophy. In fact, every nearly every anthology uh, that you'll see on uh, contemporary moral issues or abortion will have that article. It is a, it is be it has become a contemporary classic. Uh, her argument essentially says that even if the fetus is fully a human person with the right to life, this does not mean that a woman must be forced to use her bodily organs to sustain its life. Just as, one, just as one does not have a right to use another's kidney if one's kidney has failed, the fetus, although having a basic right to life, does not have a right to life so strong that it outweighs the pregnant woman's right to personal bodily autonomy. Consequently, a pregnant woman's removal of her fetus from her body, even though it will probably result in its death, is no more immoral than an ordinary person's refusal to donate his kidney to another in need of one even though this refusal will probably result in the death of the prospective recipient. This argument is, is called the argument from unplugging the violinist because of a story Thompson tells in order to illustrate her position. And this is uh, the story. Philosophers love stories. I don't know if uh, I have my own story uh, in a few minutes, and I'll share that with you. But we, it, these stories tend to illustrate uh, the moral point of view that, uh, that the particular philosopher is defending. Uh, Professor Thompson writes, quote, you wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist. A, a famous unconscious violinist. But don't fret. It's a bad pun. He has been, he has been found to have a fatal kidney ailment and the Society of Music Lovers has canvassed all the available medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you, and last night the violinist's circulatory system was plugged into yours so that your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from his blood as well as your own. The director of the hospital now tells you, look, we're sorry the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would, have, we would never have permitted it if we had known. 
but still they did it, and the violinist now is plugged into you. To unplug you would be to kill him, but never mind, it's only for nine months. By then, he will have recovered from his ailment and can safely be unplugged from you. Is it morally incumbent on you to accede to this situation? No doubt it would be very nice of you if, if you did, a great kindness. But do you have to accede to it? What if it were not nine months, but nine years, or still longer? What if the director of the hospital says, tough luck, I agree, but you've now got to stay in bed with the violinist plugged into you for the, uh, for the rest of your life? Uh, uh, because remember this, all persons have a right to life, and violinists are persons. Granted, you have a right to decide what happens in and to your body, but a person's right to life outweighs your right to decide what happens in and to your body, so you cannot ever be unplugged from him. I imagine that you would regard this as outrageous." Unquote. Thompson concludes that by use of the violinist illustration, she is only arguing that having a right to life does not guarantee having either a right to be given the use of or a right to be allowed continued use of another person's body, even if one needs it for life itself. It should not be ignored by the pro-life advocate that Thompson's argument makes some very important observations which have gone virtually unnoticed by the pro-life movement. In defending the relevance of a violinist story, Thompson points out that it is of great interest to ask what happens if, for the sake of argument, we allow the premise that the unborn are fully human or persons. How precise are we supposed to get from there to the conclusion that abortion is morally impermissible? That is to say, from the fact that a certain living organism is fully a human person, how does it logically follow that it is never permissible to kill that person? Although a near unanimous number of ethicists maintain that it is prima facie wrong to kill an innocent human person, a vast majority agree that there may be some circumstances in which taking a human life or letting a human being die is justified, such as in the event of a just war, capital punishment, self-defense, or withdrawing medical treatment. Thompson's argument, however, includes abortion as one of these justified circumstances, for she maintains that since pregnancy constitutes an infringement by the fetus on the pregnant woman's personal body, bodily autonomy, the ordinary abortion, although it results in the death of an innocent human person, is not prima facie wrong. One can immediately appreciate the appeal of this argument, especially in light of what is arguably, arguably the most quoted passage from Roe v. Wade, quote, and this is from Justice Blackmun's majority opinion, we need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins, when those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus. The judiciary at this point in the development of man's knowledge is not in a position to speculate, unquote. Although the court's, cho court's choice not to answer the question of when human life begins nevertheless resulted in a decision that concluded that legal humanity begins at birth, the court did not choose to employ Thompson's argument, though there is little doubt that it was, brought, it was probably brought to the court's attention. Consequently, the Roe court assumed the major premise of the pro-life position, as well as the position of a number of people who support abortion rights, and that is, if the fetus is a human person, then abortion in almost every case is unjustified homicide. Thus, according to a growing number of scholars, uh, this was a fatal mistake a mistake which energized the right to life movement. In fact, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in an article that appeared in the 19, uh, 1985 issue of the University of North Carolina Law Review, uh, says that that was the mistake that the court made, was actually to ignore, to make the issue the, uh, the issue that uh, did, had the moral weight, that is fetal personhood. To my knowledge, uh, the first legal scholar to recommend Thompson's argument to the judiciary is Michigan law professor Donald Regan. No, no relation to the uh, member of the Reagan administration who wrote the book uh, uh, where he talks about Nancy Reagan's uh, astrology. No, 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 nothing nothing uh, on that. Uh, in an article which appeared in, the 1970, in 1979 in the Michigan Law Review, uh, more recently, however, Professor Lawrence Tribe of Harvard Law School, whose influence on the court's liberal wing is well known, suggests in his 1990 book, Abortion, The Clash of Absolutes, that the court should have seriously considered Thompson's argument. He writes, quote, perhaps the Supreme Court's opinion in Roe, by gratuitously insisting the fetus cannot be deemed a person, needlessly insulted and alienated those for whom the view that the fetus is a person represents a fundamental article of faith or a bedrock personal commitment. The court could instead have said, if the fetus is a person, our Constitution forbids compelling a woman to carry it for nine months and become a mother, unquote. 
In his highly acclaimed book, The Culture of Disbelief, Stephen Carter of Yale Law School has also recommended Thompson's argument. Uh, you may recall that President Clinton has recommended this book highly for its critique of the uh, anti-religious sentiment among America's intellectual elite. Carter writes, quote, As many theorists have recognized, the right to choose abortion, if indeed it survives, must be based on an approach that allows abortion even if the fetus is human, instead of an approach that denies that humanity under cover of the pretense the definition is none of the state's business. The conclusion of fetal humanity by no means ends the argument. It simply forces the striking of a balance. My point is that the only fair way around a successful legislative effort to define the fetus as human, the only option that does not deride rel religiously based moral arguments as inferior to secular ones, is to argue for a right to abortion despite it. And an argument of that kind does not require an attack on the religious motivations of any abortion opponents. Unquote. I believe that those who oppose abortion uh, must be prepared to respond to this argument, for I have no doubt that it will be employed in both public debate and the courts. Um, uh, in addition to uh, what has already been mentioned, there already seems to be a subtle philosophical shift in the Supreme Court, as well as in society at large, which should indicate an openness to Thompson's argument. Uh, first, recent Supreme Court nominee, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, actually just, she's been appointed, the most recent <laughs> nominee is uh, uh, Justice Breyer, or Judge Breyer, I don't want to be presumptuous. Uh, ju uh, Justice, uh, Justice Ginsburg, in, in the 1985 article that I mentioned a couple of moments ago, chides the court for appealing to the right to privacy rather than the Equal Protection Clause in its grounding of abortion rights. She argues that since women are unique in their ability to be burdened by pregnancy, giving men a distinct advantage in social and political advancement women should have the right to abortion based on the constitutional principle that all people, regardless of gender, deserve equal protection under the law. Thus, by permitting women to undergo abortions on the basis of the Equal Protection Clause, the court would have made a clear stand for gender equity on firm constitutional grounds, rather than basing its decision on the controversial and constitutionally vague right to privacy. Second reason why I believe that there's a subtle shift, in addition to, uh, to what I've already mentioned, uh, the recent uh, physician-assisted suicide cases in Washington State and Michigan, in which, a, in which a judge in the first case and a jury in the latter acquitted physicians by appealing to an almost absolute principle of personal autonomy. The judge in Washington, Washington claims she can find it in the 14th Amendment, the same place Justice Blackmun found the right to privacy in order to constitutionally ground Roe. Third, in the 1992 case which upheld Roe as a precedent, Casey v. Planned Parenthood, the court asserted the following about the meaning of the 14th Amendment, and this is really key. Quote, Our law affords constitutional protection to personal decisions relating to marriage, procreation, family relationships, child rearing, and education. These matters involving the most intimate and personal choices a person may make in a lifetime. Choices central to personal dignity and autonomy are central to the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Beliefs about these matters could not define the attributes of personhood where they formed under compulsion by the state." Unquote. Evidently, the Supreme Court has chosen to abandon a rigorous defense of philosophical argument in the free marketplace of ideas, only to replace it with a New Age mantra in the convenience store of slogans. If Thompson's argument were to be accepted by the Supreme Court and, the same, and at the same time President Clinton's health security plan were to become a reality, this nation would be in the interesting position of maintaining that every single person in the United States has a right to health care, but not one single person has or had the right to be born. In any event, there is little doubt that a shift is occurring in the abortion debate which should be addressed by those who oppose abortion as well as those who may not favor legal restrictions, but see Thompson's argument as a threat to the moral force of parental obligations. And let us therefore take a critical look at Professor Thompson's argument. The first problem that I see with Thompson's argument is that uh, she assumes ethical voluntarism. By using the violinist story as a paradigm for all relationships, thus implying that moral obligations must be voluntarily accepted in order to have moral force, 
Thompson mistakenly infers that all true moral obligations to one's offspring are voluntary. But consider the following story. This is my story. Suppose a couple has a sexual encounter which is fully protected by several forms of birth control short of abortion. Condom, pill, IUD, etc. Just politically correct uh, sex. Uh, but nevertheless, results in conception. Instead of getting an abortion, the mother of the conceptus decides to bring it to term, although the father is unaware of this decision. After, and in fact, let's say he even offers to pay for half of the abortion. Okay, uh, So he's already, in a way, relieved, relieved himself of any responsibility. He, he, he used all the contraception and then said, here's uh, $250, since it's half mine, or, you know, I'll pay for half of it. Let's throw that in there as well. Uh, but however, she, she, she gives birth to the child and, the, and she pleads for child support. Uh, and because he refuses, she seeks legal action and takes him to court. Although he took every precaution to avoid fatherhood and thus showing that he did not wish to accept such a status, according to nearly all child support laws in the United States, he would still be obligated to pay support precisely because of his relationship to this child. As Michael Levin points out, quote, all child support laws make the parental body an indirect resource for the child. If the father is a construction worker, the state will intervene unless some of his calories he extends lifting equipment go to provide food for his children. For this reason, Keith Pavlicek argues, and I believe correctly, that given the logic of Thompson's argument, the most reasonable course to follow would be to surrender the defense of paternal support laws for those children whose fathers would rather have had their children aborted which will lend some credence not only to the pro-life insistence on the corollary that an intimate connection exists between the way we collectively relate to the unborn and the way we relate to our children after birth, but also to the claim made by pro-life feminists that the abortion mentality simply reaffirms the worst historical failings, neglect, and chauvinism of males. The second uh, problem that I see with uh, uh, Thompson's argument is, I think that you can make a case that the unborn does have a prima facie right to her mother's body. Assuming that there is such a thing as a special filial obligation, which does not have to be voluntarily accepted in order to have moral force, it is not obvious that the unborn entity, in ordinary circumstances, that is, with the exception of when the mother's life is in significant danger, does not have a natural prima facie claim to her mother's body. There are several reasons to suppose that the unborn does have such a natural claim. Unlike Thompson's violinist, who is artificially attached to another person in order to save his life and is therefore not naturally dependent on any particular human being, the unborn entity is a human being who is by her very nature dependent on her mother, for this is how human beings are at this stage of their development. Secondly, this period of human being's natural development occurs in the womb. This is the journey which we all must take and is a necessary condition for any human being's post-uterine existence. And this fact alone brings out the most glaring disanalogy between the violinist and the unborn. The womb is the unborn's natural environment, whereas being artificially hooked up to a stranger is not the natural environment for the violinist. It would seem then that the unborn has a prima facie claim upon its mother's body, which leads to my third point. The same entity, when it becomes a newborn, has a claim upon her parents to care for her, regardless of whether her parents wanted her, such as in the story of the irresponsible father. This is why we prosecute child abusers, people who throw their babies in trash cans, and parents who abandon their children. Although it uh, should not be ignored that pregnancy and childbirth entail certain emotional, physical, and financial sacrifices, these sacrifices are also endemic to parenthood in general, which ordinarily lasts much longer than nine months. And do, and, do, and do not seem to justify the execution of troublesome infants and younger children whose existence entails a natural claim to certain financial and bodily goods which, which are under the ownership of their parents. If the unborn is fully human, and don't forget Thompson is willing to grant that, why should the unborn's prima facie claim to her parents' goods differ before birth? Of course, a court will not force a parent to donate a kidney to her dying offspring, but this sort of dependence on the parent's body is highly unusual and is not part of the ordinary obligations associated with the process of human development, just as in the case of the violinist artificial dependency on the reluctant music lover. As Professor Stephen Schwartz points out, quote, so the very thing that makes it plausible to say that the person in bed with the violinist has no duty to sustain him 
namely that he is a stranger unnaturally hooked up to him, is precisely what is absent in the case of the mother and her child. That is to say, the mother does have an obligation to take care of her child, to sustain her, to protect her, and especially to, live, to, to let her live in the only place where she can now be protected, nourished, and allowed to grow, namely the womb, unquote. Now, if Thompson responds to this by saying that, and she actually, uh, I think, does say this in another article, uh, if, if she responds to this by saying that birth is the threshold at which parents become fully responsible, then she has begged the question. For her violinist argument was supposed to tell us why there is no parental responsibility before birth. That is, to t that is to say, Thompson cannot appeal to birth as the decisive moment at which parents become responsible in order to prove that birth is the time at which parents become responsible. Third uh, problem with uh, Thompson's argument is I think she, she ignores that bo abortion is indeed killing and not merely the withholding of treatment. Thompson makes an excellent point in her use of the violinist story. Namely, there are times when withholding and or withdrawing of medical treatment is morally justified. For instance, I may not, uh, more, may, may not be morally obligated to donate my, uh, or excuse me, I am not morally obligated to donate my kidney to Fred, my next door neighbor. Uh, simply because he needs a kidney in order to live. He's also quite annoying, so I wouldn't give it to him anyways. Uh, in other words, I am not obligated to risk my life so that Fred may live a few years longer. Uh, Fred should not expect this of me. He may borrow my lawnmower, but not my kidney. If, however, I donate one of my kidneys to Fred, I will have acted above and beyond the call of duty, since I will have performed a supererogatory moral act but this, is, this case is not analogous to pregnancy and abortion. Levin argues that there is an essential disanalogy between abortion and the unplugging of the violinist. In the case of the violinist, as well as in my, as my relationship to Fred's welfare, quote, the person who withdraws or withholds his assistance is not completely responsible for the dependency on him of the person who is about to die, while the mother is completely responsible for the dependency of her fetus on her. When one is completely responsible for dependence, refusal to continue to aid is indeed killing. For example, if a woman brings a newborn home from the hospital, puts it in its crib, and refuses to feed it until it is starved to death, it would be absurd to say that she, was simply, re she simply refused to assist it and had done nothing for which she should be criminally liable. In other words, just as the withholding of food kills the child after birth, in the case of abortion, it is the abortion which kills the child. In neither case is there any ailment from which the child suffers and which highly invasive medical treatment with the cooperation of another's bodily organs is necessary in order to cure this ailment and save the child's life. Or consider the case of a person who returns home after work to find a baby at his doorstep, like in the film with Tom Selleck, Ted Danson, and Steve Guttenberg, Three Men and a Baby. Suppose that no one else is able to take care of the child, but this person only has to take care of the child for, let's say, nine months. If we assume with Thompson that the fetus is as much a person as you or me, and don't forget she makes that assumption, would withholding treatment, quote unquote, from this child and its subsequent death be justified on the basis that the homeowner was only withholding treatment from a child that did not ask for in order to benefit himself? Is any person, born or unborn, obligated to sacrifice his life because his death would benefit another person? Consequently, there is no doubt that such withholding of treatment, and it seems totally false to call ordinary shelter and sustenance treatment, is indeed unjustifiable homicide. But it, is it even accurate to refer to abortion as the withholding of treatment? Uh, Professor Schwartz and uh, Ticelli, in an article that appeared in Public Affairs Quarterly, make the important point that although a woman who has an abortion is indeed withholding support from, from her unborn child, abortion is far more than that. It is the act of killing of a human person by burning him, by crushing him, by dismembering him. Euphemistically calling abortion the withholding of support or treatment makes about as much sense as calling suffocating someone with a pillow the withdrawing of oxygen. Four, Thompson's argument ignores family law. Thompson's argument is inconsistent with the body of well-established family law, which presupposes parental responsibility of a child's welfare. And of course, assuming as Thompson does that the unborn are fully human, this body of law would also apply to parents' responsibility for prenatal children. According to legal scholars Dennis Horan and Burke Balch, quote, all 50 states, the District of Columbia, 
American Samoa, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands have child abuse and neglect statutes which provide for the protection of a child who does not receive needed medical care, unquote. They further state that a review of cases makes it clear that these statutes are properly applied to secure emergency medical treatment and sustenance, food or water, which given orally or uh, through a tube, for children when parents with or without the acquiescence of physicians refuse to provide it. Evidently, pulling the plug on a perfectly healthy fetus, assuming that it is a human person, will clearly violate these statutes. Uh, for example, in a case in New York, the court ruled that the, uh, the parent's actions constituted neglect when they failed to provide medical care to a child with leukemia. Uh, the, quote, the parent may not deprive a child of life-saving treatment, however well-intentioned. Even when the parent's decision to decline necessary treatment is based on con constitutional grounds, such as religious beliefs, it must yield to the state's interests, such as, um, uh, as uh, in protecting the health and welfare of the child, unquote. The fact of the matter is that the courts have uniformly held that a parent has legal responsibility of furnishing his dependent child with adequate food and medical care. It is evident that child protection laws reflect our deepest moral intuitions about parental and community responsibility and the, and the utter helplessness of infants and small children. And without these moral scruples, which are undoubtedly undermined by brave new notions of a socially contracted voluntaristic family, Thompson's view, the protection of children and the natural bonds and filial obligations that are an integral part of an ordinary family life will become a thing of the past. This seems too high a price for bodily autonomy. Thompson offers us Pottersville when our intuitions beckon for Bedford Falls. It's one of my favorite movies, incidentally. Uh, it's a wonderful life. Uh, finally, um, Thompson's argument implies a macho view of bodily control which is inconsistent with true feminism. Some pro-life feminists have pointed out that, the Thomps that Thompson's argument and or the reasoning behind it which is supposed to be consistent with feminism, is qu actually quite anti-feminist. In response to a similar argument from a woman's right to control her own body, one feminist publication asked the question, what kind of control are we talking about? A control that allows for violence against another human being is a macho, oppressive kind of control. Women rightly object when others try to have that kind of control over, di over them, and the movement for women's rights asserts the moral right of women to be free from the control of others. After all, abortion involves violence against a small, weak, and dependent child. It is macho control, the very, the very kind the feminist movement most eloquently opposes in other contexts. Uh, Professor Celia Wolf Devine makes the observation that, quote, abortion has become in com uh, has something in common with the behavior echo feminist and pacifist feminists take to be characters characteristically masculine. It shows a willingness to use violence in order to take control. The fetus is destroyed by being pulled apart by suction, cut in pieces, or poisoned. She goes on to point out, quote, in terms of social thought, it is the masculine models which are most frequently employed in thinking about abortion. If masculine thought is naturally hierarchical and oriented toward power and control, then the interests of the fetus, who has no power, would naturally be suppressed in favor of the interests of the mother. But to the extent that feminist social thought is egalitarian, the question must be raised of why the mother's interest should prevail over the child's. Feminist thought about abortion has been deeply pervaded by the individualism which they so ardently criticize, unquote. Thank you. Any uh, questions? My question, though, is this. It does seem to me that your reaction to, uh, to the article has focused on something that there is frequently little attention to in the pro-life argument, mm -hmm. namely the issue of uh, the relationship between parents and their children. Mm -hmm. Now, if Judith Jarvis Thompson's piece has only forced us to turn attention from the question of, of personhood to the question of uh, mothers and children, mm -hmm. I think we owe Judith Jarvis Thompson a debt of gratitude. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so in terms of your reaction to build on those observations in a pro-life way and in a feminist way mm -hmm. would, be, it would take us a long uh, way. And I would wonder if you have any reaction to that, whether in fact yeah. you think there has been an, a, a shift? Well, I, I think it's, uh, uh, Thompson's view is, is interesting because it, it, it really tends to be a very strongly libertarian view, which, you know, sees rugged individualism as sort of being a paradigm for personal relationships. And, and I find it ironic that, um, that certain 
uh, people in other contexts talk about you know communitarian values and all of a sudden they'll espouse Thompson's argument which is just absolutely uh, the opposite of it uh, I, I think in that regard I think Thompson Thompson's argument has appealed to it be, appealed uh, uh, to a lot of people because it, it appeals to those intuitions that we do have about the, the people interfering with our rights and and that uh, let's say the state uh, shouldn't force people to do things uh, uh, against their will, that we have the, the tradition here in, in America, uh, but I think you're correct that it has brought to our attention something that maybe has been ignored uh, uh, by the pro-life movement, because in a, in a way, uh, the whole rights-oriented model of, of, of uh, the, the question, the question I think is usually asked by people, and my students get asked this all the time, uh, it, it's almost in moral debates, people ask, how far can I go without doing the wrong thing? In other words, it's a type of like rights-oriented conflict model, rather than asking the question, what, what would the virtuous person do? Instead of asking the more positive question, and I think that Thompson's argument, uh, unfortunately, has not been used by pro-lifers to sort of shape the debate in that way. Do you think Thompson's argument suffers from the point that she starts with the woman, the, the woman or the person being forced to hold it down to the connection to the violinist, whereas? Mm -hmm. In all but the cases of, of rape, the, uh, the pregnancy results from consenting type of action. Uh, she does address she addresses that in her, she addresses that in her argument in, in her paper, and she uses an analogy. She says, "Let's say that you left your window open and a burglar snuck in. Now, if you had sex and you didn't intend to have a, a child, that's not implied consent. Now." As far as I know, the, there's much more of a natural correlation between sexual intercourse and procreation than there is between opening up a window and a burglar sneaking in. I mean, you know, unless unless you live in some parts of the country. Uh, but uh, uh, I I agree I agree with you. I think she she, she sort of plays that down. In fact, um, she really uh, poo poos the whole the whole question of, or the whole issue of, of obligations of parents to children. She she just says, well, it, since they didn't consent. Uh, to or volunteer to be parents that they don't have any obligation, but that seems to be question making because that's the very thing she's trying to prove. You know, uh, so I don't think she wrestles with that. There's a really uh, a great article that came out a couple of years ago in a uh, by Christina Hoff Summers uh, called "Philosophers Against the Family." I don't know if it's in an anthology that she that her and her husband put together called "Vice and Virtue in Everyday Life," and it's a. Uh, it's an excellent article where even in Tom's, uh, excuse me, Summers herself is is is, is a pro-choice, but she doesn't like Thompson's argument because she sees it as an attack upon uh, the family, and she 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 sees that as uh, as something that feminists should not endure.